Remember, when we come into this world, our rules and our ideas that we've obtained come from our family or our guardians. And their moralities and their ideas of what they think is right and wrong is very different from someone else's family. So it's all made up information that has come from their ancestry. If their great great grandfather um, had a really bad situation with money, for instance, he then creates the idea in himself and then passes this information down to his children and then to the next generation, the next generation. On top of that, in shamanism, we call it um, a family uh, ancestral curse because he's and he's cursed the family into a state of lack, poverty, and scarcity. And until someone in the family stands up and says, hey, I'm willing to look outside that narrative and to create something different, it stays the same. Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that sacred messages were just revealed in newly translated Cherokee cave writings. The Cherokee people in the Southeast United States left these written accounts on cave walls of their secretive rituals up until about the 1830s. And we just recently figured out how to translate some of those messages that were written in Alabama's Manitou Cave. It's now a popular tourist destination and we just figured out how to tell that these writings describe religious ceremonies and beliefs using written symbols for 85 syllables, enough sounds to replicate the Cherokee spoken language. And this language was developed by a Cherokee scholar who did it right before the tribe was banished down the Trail of Tears, which is a series of forced relocations of Native Americans to the West. And no one recognized these inscriptions until about 2006. They're written in charcoal and archaeologists have been working on those. And some of them are religious messages to Cherokee ancestors or other supernatural beings. The script is written backwards, likely because it was supposed to be read by residents of what the Cherokee considered to be a spirit world reachable only via Manitou Cave. That's pretty amazing. We now have religious lore that was lost going back hundreds of years. You have to wonder what other lost knowledge uh, did humans figure out over the years and what's the meaning of it. And yes, because I'm a master of really subtle foreshadowing, we might be talking about some cool stuff on the show today that goes beyond just mitochondria, but might even include it. If you're hearing some background noise on the show today, that's because we're recording live at the Human Optimization Summit in London. And... My guest today is a friend, a guy who's been on the radio show today, and a sixth generation shaman, a human rights activist, a thought leader, a internationally renowned spiritual mentor and leader in women's empowerment who uses ancient spiritual wisdom and just decades of study and practice, a guy named Shaman Durek. Shaman Durek, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> I just found out that that some press is now calling you the shaman of our times, and you've been on The Doctors. You've had this amazing run-up recently in visibility, but most of the time, people sort of don't look at shamans as TV celebrities and, and things like that. So uh, what what happened to make you suddenly a household name? You know, I think what has happened is that I've made shamanism much more accessible through knowledge and information that relates to what's happening on the planet right now as it pertains to human development. And I think that a lot of people, when they think of shamans, they think of plant medicines, they think of, you know, um, tribal feathers and being in, in the indigenous tribes. And a lot of people associate shamanism also with like Peru or Mexico or, you know, um, the Andes and things of this nature. But shamanism actually de was derivative from Africa, from a woman and no um no doubt and do, uh, do we know her name no i don't know her name and it was then passed down and passed down and then went through all the different um countries and um uh you know different uh, places and it started spreading out into the latin culture and through the cuban culture and through all these different cultures and so forth and even ancient even buddhism which came from ancient bone which came from ancient shamanic knowledge that traversed across the continent so yeah, you can trace that lineage going back to Africa very, very dramatically throughout the world. It's cool. 
Yeah. And what you were saying too, what I thought was really cool, what you were talking about as far as the re the readings that they um, found on the um, walls, right? Writing backwards. So that's a technique we learn in shamanism when we want to communicate to the spirit world, we write backwards. And so when you said that, I was like, that's so cool because that exists also in, in African shamanism. Really? Yeah. So whenever I like do anything where I want the spirits to re to see something, I write it backwards if, if it's on a parchment or if I write it on the sand or the dirt or if I write it on a mirror or whatever it may be, whatever I'm invoking, I write backwards. I write my name backwards. I write the whole thing backwards. It, is that why when you take like a selfie on Instagram, the words are backwards? Because we're talking to the spirit world? I don't know about that. I think that's because you're using an iPhone and I've got an Android and you know what's up. <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking before we started recording the show about how Androids are for slow people. And uh, <laughs> I don't know that we're going to come to an agreement on that, but this is one of the, the great debates uh, of, of, of shamans in our time is what type of uh, Android phone to use. Yeah, no, but I think the reason, I think the reason literally because of like, you know, because a lot of people say to me, you know, how do you feel going on all these TV shows and, and being in the media and being, you know, this, this, this worldly shaman who's being talked about in all these countries worldwide. And what I always say to myself is it's not that it's not about that for me. It's about use, utilizing a platform of connect, uh, connection that people use to be able to get a message across to people so that they can recognize their leadership. Uh, I, I look at it the same way. I when I was 23, I was in Entrepreneur Magazine and about 80 publications as this kid just sold the first thing over the internet and we don't even know what the internet is, the first e-commerce product. But it it got to be a little bit weird because I thought, oh, if I'm, quote, famous, I'll be happy. And it did nothing for my happiness. It actually didn't change my life one bit. So I realized there's no upside to that. And being relatively well known for Bulletproof and Bulletproof Radio and all that kind of stuff, um, it's just a tool to help people. But in terms of making me feel like I'm a big deal or somehow more important or happier, it, it doesn't make you happier. It means that people stop you in airports though. Yeah. <laughs> and it causes so, a lot more stress. Yeah, too. it really it causes it, a lot it does. of stress. So for, for you, it's a tool as well as for me. I didn't, I didn't realize that you're looking at it that way, but that's, it's a beautiful way to do it. Yeah. You have to kind of create a buffer because even with my relationship um, now being with the Royal family, like I have yeah. paparazzi following me everywhere. Well, we haven't, I, some people listening probably don't know about that. So what's your deal with the Royal family? It's, oh, it's kind <laughs> of a big deal. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I forgot. Only, you know, I haven't explained it to people. Um, yeah. So I'm dating the princess of Norway. And so Ever since we made our relationship public, it's been like camera people in our face, news people in our face. Every time I go to the airport, I'm bombarded. And it's and at first, you know, because it's new to me, I had to develop a new way, a new strategy of really insulating myself from all the craziness that's coming yeah. at me from everywhere else while I'm bringing my loving service into this a, world. A lot of dark energy, for lack of a better term, comes at you when you're when when you become more visible like that. It, it feels at least to me like like there's just all sorts of weird stuff. Uh, a lot of people just sort of sending envy and other things like that at you. What? Uh, obviously, you just mentioned you're feeling that. Um, you have, if I remember right, don't you have some Norwegian heritage? Yes. From our last interview, right? So, I mean, looking at you, I wouldn't really peg you as a typical Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> no, my father's Ghani, Ghani yeah. inside is much more stronger. But your grandmother... Uh, was it your grandmother or your mother? My grandfather. Your my gran mom and my grandfather, his mother, and then his mother before. Yeah. Were Norwegian. Yeah, from Oslo. From Oslo. Wow. So you have this, and, and they were also um, of, a, of a shamanic lineage, sort of the, the Nordic style Viking. Uh, yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh, so that, it's fantastic. You're connecting with that side of your family and all of a sudden dating a royal family. Uh, that's got to take you for, uh, for a spin. Uh, what do you do uh, in order to, to keep the... Uh, um, you know, obviously no one has been successful keeping the paparazzi at bay, uh, but just in terms of all the, the negative vibes that get sent your way, because you know, who do you think you are kind of stuff yeah. um, that we all get? What, what's your, I mean, do you wake up in the morning and like send bad spirits at the people who send them at you? Or, <laughs> like, hey, come on, get, get, give me, give me the tricks, man. <laughs> well, you know, actually I'll be honest with you when it first, um, when it first went public and went worldwide and I was getting messages from friends in Japan and Mexico and everyone be like, Oh yeah. my God, you're all over the newspaper. Da, 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 da. It wasn't so much, at first I thought, okay, I can handle this. But then I went into six breakdowns. I had six like literally breakdowns which led me to a breakthrough, but it was like the most painful 
anxiety, stress. Like I was like shaking. I was waking up in panic attacks. I was like looking for my bulletproof coffee, looking for <laughs> like, I had, I literally called my assistant in LA and I was like, you got to get me like, you got to get me some bulletproof. You got to get me this. I need things that I need to stabilize. You, you wanted myself. resilience and energy. Yourself. Yeah. I needed, I needed to have that, that energy to handle that intensity. And so it took me a while. And I remember being sitting down with the royal family. And I remember my girlfriend's father, the king, he said to me, get ready for the crash course in our life. And he's like, it's going to be really intense. And he's like, and it's going to hurt sometimes, but you're going to get through it, you know? Wow. And they were, the family was very supportive. What great guidance because they've learned that. Yeah. The, the only thing close to that I've experienced, uh, I interviewed Maria Shriver and then she interviewed me on her show. And, and uh, Maria Shriver and her family are about as close to American royalty as you can get. Um, you're from the Kennedy family. And one of her children had just started dating uh, a you know, very, very well-known Hollywood guy. People who are into that stuff know who I'm talking about. And her daughter calls and is like, there's a paparazzi blocking our driveway. What do I do? And you can, it was, it's an emotional thing because like, like, you haven't yeah. experienced that before. And it was so cool because Maria was like, oh, here's what to do. And she knew the playbook and just was like, oh, it's calm. It's normal. Like, we'll handle with the police, whatever. But it was, it was just a non-issue for her. But for, for someone who hasn't experienced it before, even her daughter was like, oh my God, I'm ungrounded. I don't feel safe. All this kind of crazy stuff. But you have a royal family who has 10 generations of this in, in their training, sitting you down and telling you what to do. Yeah. Oh my God, that's legit. Yeah. And I think, I think the aspect of it was, and I made mistakes. Like, I'll be honest, I made mistakes. And there's time where they brought me back in and they're like, you can't say this, you can't do this, you can't talk about this. You have to close the bathroom windows before you I shower. have to keep the bathroom <laughs> windows closed. I have to close the curtains in my house yeah. because they have these big lenses. Yeah. And they caught me, you know, they, they catch me or they'll be outside my door and they'll take pictures of me when I come out. And they're like, it's a little crazy. But what I've did, what it did do for me um, is it helped me pay more attention to where I, what I do with my energy. Yeah. Where do I go? Who do I spend my time with? Why am I spending time with them? And if I'm going to an event, why am I supporting this event? What am I doing it for? And then what it also did was I got a lot of hate mail, which I get every morning. I get like hundreds of hate mail every morning. And that taught me the state of the world. Cause like at first it bothered me. And then I was like, mm, it doesn't need to bother me because I know who I am. So let me move past that. And then let me just look at what people are actually saying. And the thing that kept coming up was, um, people wanted to hang me or gut me or like lynch wow. me, or it was like, you don't belong with our Aryan it, princess. There's a lot of like, like racial shit. A lot out. of racial stuff. Good God, man. But from both sides. So it was oh, racial wow. from, from one side. And then you had the, the melanated, like the black community going, oh, and how could you sell out? How could you be with this white devil? And like, it was just, and it was just very me. And me and my girlfriend would just sit there and we'd just be like, wow. wow. Like, do you know who my grandmother is? <laughs> but yeah, you know, and it's like, <laughs> wow, this is what the world, this is what, this is what needs to be un, un, like up, you know, lifted up and, and, and brought out to be seen so it can be healed. Like these are the wounds of the world. That, that need to Good come out God. so that was very interesting and then the other narrative came out was oh and not only is he with the princess and with the royal family and he's a shaman so people started freaking out about like there's a shaman in the palace so they started calling me rasputin and like basically wow. saying i'm gonna take down the monarchy with black magic or whatever the heck they believe it is and um, so doctors started coming at me. So I had like a slew of doctors, like going through everything I've ever said and trying to debunk everything I said. Then it was the religious group. So it was like, I think it was 5,000 people marched again. Like people stood up against me because they we were supposed to be speaking in this church, me and my girlfriend. And they didn't want us in the church because they said we serve the devil. That's great publicity, man. I mean, it's been interesting. <laughs> it's been quite a ride. While I'm doing the book and like going out there and speaking to people and, and really wanting people to get more educated about what's happening because people think the book the shaman the spirit hacking is just yeah. about shamanic tools it's literally about what's happening in the world today the, i was going to ask you that how much of this made it into spirit hacking so i, I wrote the foreword for spirit hacking this is your new book one of the reasons i'm having you on the show again uh, but i mean it, it's a it's a profound and interesting book saying hey like here's what i'm doing as a shaman in a, a very accessible open way and talking about what's going on in the world from the perspective of someone who has, you know, at least half your brain in a reality that most people don't live in. 
But how much of the the royal experience made it into the book, or these are happening simultaneously? Um, none of it made it into okay. the book. But what did go into the book was just the experiences that I've had while navigating and staying in that spirit realm, while navigating in this plane of um, of awareness, and watching how we're adapting as human beings. What are some of the things that are actually affecting us from not seeing our power, our gifts, and our awareness of being able to really become, um, you know, a high performance human being and like what's getting in the way of that? What, what are the things that it's pulling us? What's pulling our attention and then giving people simple tools to be able to ha spirit hack themselves back into a space where they can navigate this time right now, which I call the blackout, which is a, which is a very, um, you know, definitive time that happens a lot on our planet. It's when the species goes so far off the rails and they need a big old shake it up to wake it up. And that's what's happening right now globally. It's not usually it happens in like one continent or one state or one place. Now it's happening on a global level. And so how do we up level ourselves? And that's what this book is about. And so a lot of I, you know, when I was writing it, I was like, do I, I see so many shamanic books talking about the same narrative, which to me is, is just kind of boring. It's just, okay, it's Palo Santo sticks, drumming, plant medicine, how my plant medicine journey was. I mean, that's great and that's wonderful and all, but no one really talks about the truth of like shamanic wisdom and philosophy that has been passed down through my lineage, my family from the Mbutu and from the Lukumi and from my Yoruba um, heritage to understanding how to um, facilitate that in today's modern culture. So you you definitely go deep in the book on on the thinking behind shamanic stuff. And I, I had to come to grips with this of going back uh, to when I was about 30. I've, I'm a computer science guy, studied artificial intelligence, come from a family of engineers who think pretty much anything in that realm is, is for uh, crazy people. And I'm like, okay. Uh, however, I just did some holotropic breathing here and I'm seeing some crazy stuff here. And of course, my thought was, then there's something wrong with me. And I just realized, wait a minute. When you can talk to a shaman from your heritage and you can talk to another shaman from, let's say, like Alberto Vieto uh, from Peru, right? And you guys compare notes. Those notes have an awfully crazy amount of commonality. And you both know the places you go. And then you look at, the writings from Hinduism or Buddhism or ancient Chinese medicine. And you're all working in the same states. They're just stuff that most people don't see most of the time. Why don't we see that? Well, I feel like a lot of people don't see that because they're programmed into a way of thinking based on their family upbringing. Remember, when we come into this world, our rules and our ideas that we've obtained come from our family or our guardians. And their moralities and their ideas of what they think is right and wrong is very different from someone else's family. So it's all made up information that has come from their ancestry. If their great great grandfather um, had a really bad situation with money, for instance, he then creates the idea in himself and then passes this information down to his children and then to the next generation, the next generation. On top of that, in shamanism, we call it um, a family uh, ancestral curse because he's and he's cursed the family into a state of lack, poverty, and scarcity. And until someone in the family stands up and says, hey, I'm willing to look outside that narrative and to create something different, it stays the same. And so what I feel is the reason why people aren't seeing these things is because they want to be comfortable with the information that they have. But I think a true human being who wants to become more powerful and more superhuman and like you talk about in your book, they have to be willing to transverse into the places that are most uncomfortable. Like I hear a lot of times in the very spiritual community, people say, oh, I don't resonate with that. And I, and I laugh so hard all the time. My girlfriend, she giggles because I always tell people, if you're saying you don't resonate with that, that's because that is what you need to be resonating. Oh, hold with. on a second here. Do you resonate with the racist assholes who are coming after you online? So let me give you my understanding yeah. of resonate. Yeah. Resonation basically means your attention or your energy has been focused upon, therefore you want to reject it. So if your attention and energy has been focused upon it, there's a part of your being that is drawing your attention to it because either one, you have the knowledge or the capability to bring some level of balance or understanding to what you're seeing, or there's something that needs healing and that's why you're actually seeing it. So we as human beings have been taught that anything that's uncomfortable, we go the other way. Whereas in shamanism, it's everything that's 
uncomfortable, you go towards it. So I call it lean into your aversions, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what makes you actually stronger. So you actually build what we call spiritual immunity. Spiritual immunity, just like you're talking about the body and its own immune system, you have a spiritual immune system. You have an energetic system in your body that literally learns by how you operate in your life through energy patterns, responses, frequencies, how you speak, your words you choose to use that have coding. Everything is building that immune system or tearing down that immune system. So when I say, if someone says to me, oh, I don't resonate with those people who are doing this and that and the other, I'm like, actually focus your attention on there because something in your spirit is asking you to go and look at what this energy is because it's going to bring more resilience to you. And so you're saying if you resonate with it, it, it can just pass through you without affecting you. Right. So if you do resonate with it, so it's not triggering and it's not attractive. So you're neutral to it. You got it. All right. You got it. And, and it is absolutely true that if you spend your time hating someone, it makes them stronger. And it, it really does do that. So that said, it's hard to ignore someone who's punching you in the face or stealing your stuff or whatever else. So there's times when you, you know, I'm going to stop that, right? Because uh, it, it's not right. How do you draw the line between, oh, um, you know, I'm, I'm not resonating with it, you know, or, or I'm resonating with it as passing through me, but you're actually dealing with someone who's, you know, steal, like someone who would say, copy your book and publish under your name. People do that to my book all the time. I have to keep shutting them down. So how do you, how do you handle it with someone stealing from you or, or physically threatening you? What's the shamanic perspective on that? So first thing we all, in shamanism, we look at everything from the nuclei. We look at the nuclei of the soul, the soul of the nuclei. That means that you are in the center of the command post of creating all of these different situations that take place in your life. So the understanding is one, like for instance, like I'll use my sense of my own knowledge. Like I get all this knowledge and I have all this knowledge and I can lay a buffet out for people to be able to understand how to navigate both um, the spirit world and the physical world and to bring the invisible into the tangible in a very easy and effective way. However, I that information doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the universal consciousness. I'm just the vessel that it's coming through. So I never look at anything being stolen from me. I always look at it as like, if someone feels like they wanna copy something or do something, that's their choice. But now let's say for instance, someone is like battering me or whatever. Well, I mean, there is a consciousness of defending yourself from the perspective of self-preservation. What, what, okay, so I'm, I'm about to publish Shaman Durek's Guide to uh, to Porn Enjoyment. And I'm going to use your name on it, even though I'm not you, obviously. If I was to go do that, I could do that on Amazon and they would take money for it, right? So I, it's an example like that. We're, we're, we're actually saying, okay, there's clearly you're, you're going to protect yourself physically, but it, I'm, I'm asking this because a lot of the health influencers I'm friends with, we're, we're all dealing with this and people deal with this stuff at work all the time. And, you know, people who either misuse your name or harming your reputation or taking, you know, not necessarily your intellectual property. There's lots of people who put butter and coffee. I'm very pleased about that because it's better than milk and coffee, right? Like, like that, that's a good thing. It, it's a movement it, towards up-leveling, but it's one thing if, if another person says I'm Dave Asprey and they're not Dave Asprey. Right. And then they copy my blog posts and use it for financial gain in a way that harms my brand. Well, and that's, how, how do you deal with like shamanic with resonance or something like that? That's a specific example, but you must be getting some of those people or, you know, they're, they're doing a deep fake video of you, or they're saying you said this and you didn't say this. What, what's the shamanic take on that? Cause it well, seems like I mean, it's worse. first of all, those are two different things you're saying. So let's go with the first one you said, which was, um, someone copying your book and putting you into a situation that actually harms your company. That's when you actually have to go and you have to set an example of integrity and responsibility which basically in shamanism means responsibility means the ability to show up with love for yourself and take action with your lawyers or whatever it is to be okay. able to stop that person. That was the first thing you were talking about. So shamanically, there is a common sense value of being able to navigate whatever the situation is. And also what we do as shamans is not just look at it from the physical, we also look at it from the internal. If I'm the creator of all of my experiences and everything that's triggering me, affecting me, or causing some harm to me is some aspect inside of me that I am creating. So you could actually be creating a thought or a feeling inside of you that people want to take from you or the idea that people 
will take from you because of the information you have, then the universe will then your ego, of course, because we in shamanism, we don't see the ego the same way other people see the ego. We see the ego as what we call the great paperweight or the anchor. So what the ego does is the ego goes, whatever you believe, I'm going to support that narrative and then draw all the characters and people in your life to run that narrative for you so you can be right. So, so you would do that inner work at the same time that you have your attorney pummeling them. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so this is that one foot in the shamanic world, one foot in the the Western world, whatever you want to call it, and and so you're able to execute on both at the same time. And a traditional person raised in the West is like, I just called my attorney and then I got pissed off about it, but they wouldn't look at why am I pissed off, what's going on there, so then they would feel more emotional pain, they wouldn't work through it. Well, that's the whole thing, Dave, is that we keep a society of people looking outside at obstacles and looking at things as if they're happening to us. And like even in relationships, like my relationship with my girlfriend, people always go, wow, you guys never argue. Like it's crazy because when I say something to her that's insulting or if I snap at her, immediately if I know I'm upset, I know it has nothing to do with her. I go right into myself and go, what is my trigger? What upset me? Where does it come from? Why am I putting power there? Why am I running this narrative? Where is my ego supporting this narrative? Do I want to ask my ego to dismantle from that narrative and choose to support a narrative that supports me not having that trigger anymore? And then I apologize to her for snapping because I realize it has nothing to do with her. So a perfect example is I had a friend, for instance, and when I first uh, started, press started coming towards me saying, hey, we want to write about you, whatever. She said to me, I can't believe that you would sell out. You are a real shaman and you would actually put yourself in a magazine or anything that's in the media world. It's like, that's that's like the monster. Like, why would you do that? You should still let people come to you and find you through their own resources, not because they read about you in a magazine. I feel like you're selling out. So she said this to me. I was hurt. I got a little upset by it, but I went to my room. I sat in meditation and I went inside and I said, okay, why was I triggered? And where do I believe this in myself? And immediately I heard, you have this feeling about yourself that you're selling out to your family roots, to who you are. And she's coming in and showing you the reflection of what you already feel. So change your feeling and watch what happens. So I changed my feeling. Two days later, I see the same friend. She goes, you know what, Derek? I was thinking about what I said to you and I was wrong and I'm sorry. Wow. And I realized that you having you be out there in the magazine is gonna help people get your message. Yeah. So I think this is the best place for you to be. Now, same thing happened when I went to Israel in the middle of a war, 90s, early 90s, bombs are going off in Israel. I wake up, I get this message from spirit. My ancestors was like, you need to be in Israel right now. You need to be there to help the people. Tell my dad, I'm going to Israel. My dad like yells at me. There's war there. What kind of son have I raised? I don't care if you're the shaman. I don't care what the spirits told you. You could end up in a bomb. There's like, there's, they're blowing up buses. They're doing this. Like he laid out every single wow. possibility of damage that could happen to me. Sure enough, I go to Israel. Call my dad on the phone a week later. Call I, But in that week, I did all this internal uh, love on myself. I went in and I was like, what is my issue about being here? I'm fine here. I'm good here. I can't wait to see all the beautiful things here, learn about the culture, learn the language, learn the people. Call my dad a week later. He's like, oh, I'm so happy you're there. This is going to be so good. You're going to learn about people. You're going to learn about the language. You're going to do all these things. I was like, who are you? Because you weren't the person who was cursing me out on the right. phone the other day. It's because I changed the internal narrative. So the outward projection or the screen in which we project upon, which is the world and people and all these things actually change as well. And it, it may sound weird to people listening. You're saying, how, how is it that your internal dialogue, it's not even dialogue, but the internal energy towards something would change the reality outside of you. And I have experienced this dozens and dozens of times in my own work at 40 years of Zen, you know, these advanced forgiveness states, and even with clients there, there are people, in fact, it's not even remarkable at this point where someone does uh, you know, forgiveness and deep energetic healing on uh, an old friend or a family member they haven't talked to in 20 years. And magically the next day they get a text message out of the blue from like, uh, I can't explain it other than what you're saying. There's some sort of an energetic thing. It changes. And I, I really do believe that the world around you changes based on that, but it's not based on a thought. It's based on, on a feeling or an energy or an imprint. And you go into some of this in, in spirit hacker 
And you talk about you know, shamanic awareness and, and you teach about it in a very, very accessible way. But you also talk about some other stuff like like fire scrying. Can you tell me what the heck that is and what, what's the what's the role of fire scrying for people who aren't actually shamans? Yeah. So fire scrying basically is most human beings in their life, their brain isn't optimized in a way that allows them to access all of the things that are going on behind the scenes. They don't see the peripheral vision of reality. They're only looking at what's drawing their attention, what's causing them to react emotionally, and what's basically their agenda that they have set for the day. So their will is not really strong. Most human beings walk around with weak wills. They think they have really strong wills, but then some, when they're met with something that's really intense, like there's a bomb that goes off or like, you know, someone's getting murdered in front of them or there's a fire in the rainforest or there's this thing happening to them. And all of a sudden they're emotionally upset and they're going through all of these things and they can't stay focused and they don't know what's going on or they get fog brain or all these little different things happen. And in fire scarring, in shamanic technique, one of the trainings that I teach a lot of my students, like I have this kid right now, he's like 10 years old. He's been training with me for three years and he practices his fire scarring and he says, Shaman Durek, I'm so good now in school because my focus of my will is so strong, nothing can move me. Nothing can distract me. Nothing can sway me. Nothing moves him out of his, of his range of focus. And so what fire scrying does is it basically teaches you how to direct your attention on one thought, one thing for a period of time. So like I have a student who just actually called me a couple of days ago and said, I'm up to an hour now of complete focus on one thought without having other thoughts come in. That's a powerful tool when you want to manifest something, when you want to have the direct focus on something, when you want to be so precision based on an idea or thought or uh, some form of intellect that would other have you distracted by the world that's around you, such that if you have kids, or if you have family, if you have noise, if you have a fire engine truck, if you have this thing happening or that thing happening or a crowded room. So a lot of times in shamanism, a lot of our training is like, if I teach people how to meditate, I don't teach them how to meditate under a brook with a stream with the sounds of birds and like, you know, the ocean sounds. I take them to the most distracting, noisy, uncomfortable, most discordant place that they would find to upset them and teach them how to meditate. Like I used to take people to rock concerts and teach them how to meditate <laughs> while people are like listening to rock music and how to stay there. How can you sustain your meditation for one hour without being affected by anything that's happening that you actually absorb into every flux of frequency? That's what fire scaring is about. It's about teaching you how to have a strong will because if you don't have a strong will, then the system can throw anything at you. And that's what the system does. This matrix that we live in, this system that is built by creating division, wants people to be reactive, wants people to constantly be blitzed out, sugared out, put poisons in their body, you know, dope them up on every type of chemical you can imagine and keep them so brain dead so that whenever they throw some crazy dramatic thing at you, you're in shock and you're having what I call post-traumatic stress disorder in your spiritual, emotional, and mental body, not just in your physical body. It exists on all levels of your body. So you have four levels. You have your physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual body. If your mental, spiritual, and emotional body are having post-traumatic stress disorder, you may not realize it, but you're creating what is called aggressive markers. And those aggressive markers create inflammation in the body because your body then begins to think it's constantly under attack. And you just don't understand why you're constantly tired, why you're constantly on edge and all these things. And so fire scarring is like teaching your will to be so strong and so perfectly in alignment to whatever it is you're directing your attention to that nothing can sway you and nothing can affect you. Why is it called fire scrying specifically? Because you actually stick fire in front of you and you stare at the flame of the fire okay. without diverting your attention to anything else. And that's a, a really powerful technique. I, I did this years ago with a group that teaches how to travel out of your body and stuff like that. You sit there and you stare at a candle and, and it does something different. Question, does it work with an LED candle? <laughs> no, that's a good question, Dave. <laughs> Why don't you go and do no, you, that no, you, and then report back to me? Uh, I mean, you never had someone try with those dumb little digital cameras? I've never had that. <laughs> I, I do not believe it'll work. Now, the, the Buddhist people that I trained with- I don't think it would. At, at Kopan Monastery, they're like, look, light is light. and we, we make a light offering. We don't kill butterflies with this kind of light. Although I think they do because they disrupt their, their navigation, but whatever. At least they're not burning in a candle. So they would do that, but 
there is an analog signal in fire. It, it's got warmth and radiance and it flickers in a, in a rhythm, not in a rhythmic, but in a, a sinuous natural way. Yeah. And when you have a digitally blinking light that goes, you know, blinks a little brighter, blinks a little, a little dimmer. I think there's something in the brain that detects the little square, uh, square waves instead of the round waves and that it is not a peaceful meditation in the same way. So I would say make a real fire. Uh, it seems useful, but don't fall asleep when you're meditating unless you have some sort of metal underneath it. Cause who wants to meditate through an actual house fire? That sucks. Yeah. Or put it in a bowl of water, which, yeah. is, which is also a great, yeah, that's, that's even better. Okay. Uh, all right. I, I really do believe there's something, something special about fire and it's, it's a, a traditional thing. And I've, you know, done full moon fire ceremonies. I have a fire pit at my house and all that stuff. And just for the record, I have no idea why any of that stuff works. All I know is I've been taught by great masters from multiple, uh, multiple lineages. You should do this sometimes. And when I do it, things, things seem to work better. It could all be placebo in which case, great. Uh, I'm okay with that too. It, it's all right. And the follow on question of that though is, how many hours a day do you spend meditating, uh, sitting in a pose, looking at a fire, like like your your shamanic preparation, beginning end of day? How much time do you spend on that? So I what um I do different types of meditations. Yeah. I don't believe in silent meditation because I think silent meditation um well one it's boring to me, and secondly I my whole focus is to understand myself, not to disconnect from myself. Mm. So what, if I do a sit down meditation, it's usually me listening to all the thoughts that are going through and then talking to them. So Out loud. Yeah. So like if a thought comes through and it's like, Oh, I should have went to the grocery store. But like, why should you have gone to the grocery store? And, okay. So you're sitting in a room by yourself talking. Yeah. Okay. To all my thoughts that I hear popping up in my head. Okay. Right. And then what it does is I realize that some of those thoughts aren't me. They're like other people's yeah. thoughts. And then some of those thoughts are other people's thoughts. They're spirits. And then I find that they're energy echoes that have been left behind in the home that I'm at or the place that I want to. I picked it up empathically. So what it does is it teaches me how to differentiate energy. And it also teaches me how to not accept everything in my head as me, which is a big thing that I find in, yeah. in today's world that people just think whatever's in their head. They're like, oh, yeah, that's me thinking it. Uh we have these, these ancient urges and we have these spiritual intervention things that I, I believe are totally real. Cause I know people can turn them on at will. <laughs> so it seems like one of those things you can start it, stop it, start it, stop it. It's probably real. Uh, but uh, I, I have definitely experienced more than a few times what you're talking about. And then if you believe that you are every thought and emotion that you have, you will have this immediate desire to, you know, pull back from something because it's fear, but it's not your fear. Or you'll think an incredibly inappropriate thought about a friend that you would never actually go to bed with, but you're like, you just caught a, a you know, you, you caught a look and, and all of a sudden the thought comes to you, you can say, you know, what kind of a bad person am I? Cause I thought about that. Or you might catch yourself having a, a racist thought and you're like, I'm not a racist. Like I, I know I'm not that right. And no matter what color your skin is, like you're just thinking an ill will about someone for no reason other than how they look, right? And okay, you could feel great guilt and be like, I'm a bad person because this is going on in my head. Or you could say, that shit isn't mine, right? And you can reject it. And in and, and finding for me that, that, okay, great, I don't walk around with a nasty voice in my head the vast majority of the time because I've edited that out. Uh, and some of the techniques that are in spirit hacking are techniques that I use. I do a lot of neurofeedback and breathing and heart rate and all kinds of crazy stuff. But the bottom line is I'm pretty good at figuring out when it's mine. But if you don't, if you, if you think you're good, there still will be times when you're absolutely convinced that a thought in your head is your own thought, but it may not be your own thought. It may be a, an automatic system. And then I told myself a story about it. How does someone listening to the show know whether it's their ego talking to them, whether it's some interventional shamanic zone thing, or whether it's an authentic them. Right. So let's, I want to differentiate the ego first because okay. everyone has this interpretation that the ego is this, this bad thing because we have this thing on our planet where we always try to create things either into monsters or into angels. And it really creates um, a great uh, divide, especially in duality as far as quantum entanglement is concerned, because we keep polarizing each polarization of what if it's good or bad and giving power to it instead of just seeing it as whole as Lord Siddhartha did, who became the Gautama Buddha. So 
really realizing that the ego just does one thing. It's a part of the, it's a part of your consciousness that supports your narrative or doesn't support your narrative. So if you have an ego that is held in the field of I'm a bad person, then the ego will send every opportunity for you to be right about being bad. So it's there to take your world and make it real for you. So what happens is when people go into this aspect of what's their real voice and what's not the real voice, the real voice of a human being is always based in love because you came from love, you created from love, and you also return to love. So that in shamanism is the first key element that we look yeah. for. We call it love intelligence. So whenever we are operating in the field of consciousness, we ask ourselves, if it's love intelligence, it's all inclusive. If it's love intelligence, it's not a me, but it's a we. If it's love intelligence, it's operating in the field that it's about if I'm innovating or creating or inventing, it's not for me. It's for we. It's for all of us. So if I'm going to do anything, I have to think that it's not me focusing on what I want to have so I can have profit and I can have a good life. It's that the more life I have, the more life other people get to have. So you'll know if your thoughts are supportive, are your thoughts supportive to the collective is your thoughts operating in the field of love. And when I say love, I don't mean love that's created by the system, which is held in the Valentine's Day gifts and love that you get when you get a, a, a gift from someone that you think they love you. I'm talking about unconditional love and acceptance. It's the ability to say, instead of saying the waters are dirty, you can say, oh, the waters are dirty. However, they're getting cleaner and there's people waking up right now who are finding ways to keep this water clean. So you're actually, you're, you're making your narrative support Support the system of change versus support the system of destruction. So you, that's how we differentiate. And then what, as far as the ego is concerned, if I have a belief, for instance, like the world's a scary place, I ask the ego, ego, do I have a belief that's limiting me from seeing the world from a place of love? The ego will then communicate to me yes or no. And then I can say, ego, detach from this belief and then send the energy through my body of what that detachment feels like, and then support this belief, and then the ego then transfers its energy to the new belief, and all of a sudden, I don't have those experiences anymore. Uh, that, is, uh, that is super cool. I, I, I like that perspective a lot. It's, I, I believe that ego is part of the meat operating system. It, it helps to keep the meat alive. And right? so you're, you're not ever going to be free of your ego. But if it's a thought that evol involves aversion uh, or ill will towards other people, it's pretty much not me. It might be an automated system in my body that's programmed that way, right? And I'm responsible for it, and I, I can manage that, but it's not actually the, the who I am. So you can sort of divide it very much in with what you just said, where there's this ability to say, all right, what's the filter? And as a you know, Westerner computer science guy, the filter is if I'm thinking bad stuff about anyone or anything, then that is actually not an authentic day of thought. That is an intrusion on my system, whether it's from old automated reptilian stuff, whether it's from something happening when I was in first grade and you know, some, someone yelled at me, or I don't know, some, something I've forgotten, but is still in there somewhere. Uh, or uh, whether it's, you know, some powerful shaman cursing me with, uh, you know, bad magic. I mean, <laughs> I, I, obviously I'm making that up, but here's the thing. I know. I, I love it. Though. I, I don't know. I look, look, this, I'm not an expert in those fields. I don't even, I'm not a hundred percent convinced that half the stuff that people believe they're doing when they're doing shamanic stuff is actually happening. But I do know that some people have a crazy impact on others and some of them are great friends. Right. And that is a, that is a real fact. And some of them are less powerful than they think they are, but they're still powerful. And some of them are more powerful than they think they are. All right. So since that's the world I live in, all I know is I'm sitting all of a sudden, I'm thinking super hateful thoughts about someone. I, I got to figure out why, but that isn't the core. That isn't the core me. And so my filter is there aversion, ill will, ego or external. And then actually the fourth F that I talk about, you know, there's fear, there's food there's the other F word. And the other one is friend after that. And, and that's what all life does. It actually forms communities and all that. So that's right. if I'm working in that fourth F around how do I serve others? How do I take care of myself? How do I take care? That's probably authentic. The rest of that stuff, eh, like it's got to be managed. Uh, so that that's maybe, I think very much in alignment with, with what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, in tribal culture, for instance, if someone in the tribe falls into that space, 
every member of the tribe instead of going that person's bad which is what we've been doing a lot in today's society oh, is yeah. look going on these witch hunts and these monster hunts and always looking for the bad guy so we can exalt ourselves better than the other person which actually does nothing for our evolution it actually depletes our ability yeah. to evolve but in tribal culture uh, literally the person who's having that situation happen, every member of the tribe goes to that person and says, I'm here to support you and help you because by lifting and shifting that person, the tribe thrives. One person down in the tribe, the, thr the whole tribe is affected. And so the same thing happens to us. People don't realize that the man who can't pay his rent in LA is being affected by an energetic frequency of the man who is starving in um, in Uganda. So all of, we're all connected. And so in shamanism, we look at this connection and we see that like, for instance, you can go into nature, for instance, and this is a shamanic practice, and the and plants that are much more creating defense mechanisms and animals that are more aggressive teaches us that the surrounding villages and places where people dwell, they're holding that synthesis inside of them because plants experience everything through synthesis and through these subtle energy frequencies. And that means that they are actually picking up on the nuances of human beings and then transferring it into the plant kingdom and learning how to develop. The same thing happens with animals and the same thing happens with children. Children, animals use synthesis and emotion and empathy to understand what their parents are really about. Parents can be the most amazing parents taking their kids to all these things and doing all these things but the kid doesn't do it. when i work with children the kids tell me it's so funny how my parents make it all about them they make it all about them they never play video games with me they never do the art with me they never come into my world to see what i'm looking at to see what i see and so as human beings we we tend to get stuck in that narrative of, you know, wanting to to only see our world and what we, and way we actually create community and and how we we build community is be able to see other people's worlds and how we can like the cells in the body how can we coexist with each other without feeling threatened. It, it's kind of funny. Uh, this morning, uh, my daughter Anna, who's who's twelve, uh, she knew that I was going to meet with you today, and she. He said, I want to come and see Shaman Durek. And my kids get to meet a lot of really interesting people, but they don't usually ask to go meet them again. And she was willing to set her own alarm clock, wake up at 6.30 in the morning, which isn't very natural for a 12-year-old, get herself ready so we could be out the door so I could be on stage. And she sat with me and all. And one of the reasons she came is she said, there's two people I want to see. I want to see Shaman Durek and I want to see Dr. Barry. Right. And of all the dozens of people here who she's met and all that stuff, she, she wanted just to, to say hi and, and see you. And it's because of that actually seeing a child and, and being willing to come to them on their level and listening. So it, it stands out, though, because kids are very perceptive. Yeah. And also when I was at your house, I play with them. Like we, yeah. like we were playing with the, the, she makes all the clay dragons and stuff. And I was like giving them names and like okay. playing with her. And then we would go into nature and they were like showing me all the plants and the sheep and okay. we were dodging the poop on your land and like <laughs> <laughs> lots of poop, lots of soil, <laughs> lots of poop, lots of soil. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I love your children and I love children in general because I see them wiser than some of the human beings that I actually sit down with. Mm -hmm. And I love spending time with kids and talking to them and getting their consciousness um, of what they feel, getting into their consciousness of what they feel about life because children don't have filters and they haven't been programmed with filters until their parents keep programming with them filters. And so when they don't have those filters, I want to hear the raw information that's coming from them, which teaches me a lot. I learn a lot. They're some of the greatest teachers of mine have been children. It's, uh, it's true. You can learn a lot from your kids and you know, they can learn a lot from you and you don't have kids. No, not yet. You thinking about it? Yes. Wow. All right. That, that'll that be interesting. Uh, well, when you have kids, I'm going to teach them to dodge poop. It'll be fun. <laughs> I'm going to bring them to your house. <laughs> you, you write something in, in uh, spirit hacking that's, that was really cool. And I haven't heard it said this way. And you say, quote, I call people who identify with their pain hurt collectors. And it, it seems like there's a lot of victims who identify with their pain, even, okay, I had toxic mold exposure. I had chronic fatigue and people say, Oh, you're a victim of chronic. I'm like, no, I haven't been a victim of these things. The fact that I had this stuff and it sucked, I needed a name for it so I could figure out how to hack it. 
what do you mean by hurt collectors and how do people get out of that? How do you spot hurt collectors and get away from them? Or like, do you, what do you do with hurt collectors? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you give them more hurt because they collect it? You're like, here, let me slap you a couple of times there. Like, like, what, how do you deal with hurt collectors and how do you not be one? Well, what you're talking about is actually something that's happening to you based on circumstances such yeah. as like being exposed to mold and stuff like that. And your body's going through its process of cleansing or you, you know, you're going through healing in that sense. But when, when I talk about hurt collectors, I'm talking about people who go through pain and then mm -hmm. and use the pain narrative to have more pain so that they can get love and they can get sympathy from the people yeah. around them and so they go around collecting hurt and they don't let go of anything they just keep you know cycling it and cycling it and cycling it and those people live off of that pain. And, you know, and we as a society have been constantly indoctrinated in that idea. I mean, I, I talk about in the Spirit Hacking book about Jesus, for instance, the narrative of Jesus. It's like we have this man who's wearing this dirty underwear on a cross, bleeding from his head, and he's suffering. Why don't we have pictures of him where he wasn't suffering and he's giving love to people and sharing knowledge and wisdom? But we always use the narrative of the victim. And we use the, vic the biggest victim narrative because we think that the underdog, the biggest victim, the this, the that. So everyone is screaming, who's the biggest victim on the planet right now? Instead of going, who's the biggest hero on the planet who's overcome and shifted out of that perspective into leadership? You know, what that reminds me of is one of the coolest quotes ever um, is uh, Mr. Rogers talking about Love his, Mr. Rogers. his mom. <clears throat> and and he's, he says when he was a child, you know, he'd see pictures of war or disasters or fires or something. And his mother would just say, look for the helpers. And that in every one of these pictures, there's always a fireman, there's always a policeman, there's always a rescuer, there's always someone coming to help. And that your filter for the picture can be a look at the pain, look at the suffering, look at the victims, or look at the people who run towards the disaster to help. And like what a powerful framing for all this stuff. And it sounds like it's right in alignment with the shamanic teachings uh, that you're offering in Spirit Hacking. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, you can either be a patient or you can be a doctor. So it's like if you're talking to someone, you need to be a patient and suffer with them and then just keep narrative of suffering going on planet Earth. Or we pull ourselves off the wheel of suffering and we get into an understanding that you suffering is a choice. I was on dialysis for eight years, okay? And out of eight years getting stabbed with these needles the size of a pencil and getting like the most excruciating pain, screaming myself sometimes to sleep or screaming myself out of my pain, I never complained once because I kept my focus on the experience of dialysis and what I was learning from it and how I could help the other patients and things that I was doing to sustain myself so that I could see um, clients after my sessions where other patients would be stuck in bed because the pain was so much they couldn't get out of bed. I looked at how was I able to lecture on stage, speak to people do healing on people, do all of these things and still be doing the same thing that everyone else is doing at the dialysis center, but I have lit energy and I'm full power. And it was because of what I was eating. It was because of the sleeping. It was the meditation. It was all the shamanic exercises. And so when I think about it is that the pain narrative or the hurt narrative doesn't need to be in the equation for how we operate and how we survive. We can't keep using pain and suffering as a way to push evolution. And I feel like on our planet, we keep waiting for some horrible thing to happen. Then everyone wants to make changes. You know, 9-11 happened. I remember it like, like it was yesterday. When 9-11 happened, there were no yoga centers in New York City. There were no juice bars. There was none of these meditation centers, nothing. Soon as 9-11 happened, and I was a shaman doing stuff in New York. I remember one of my good friends, Light Watkins, we used to make jokes about it all the time, like how we were the first. And literally when that building, when those two brothers came down, all of a sudden, yoga centers, meditation centers, this thing, that thing. Why do we have to keep pushing the pain envelope to, to bring change upon our species? Well, didn't you kind of push the pain envelope with eight years of dialysis and an incredibly painful upbringing in order to become who you are? No, I pushed uh, th those experiences actually taught me about human development, how humans suffer that I don't use that as a narrative to push me to be who I am. All of those right. experiences gave me, oh, this is what happens when you suffer. Oh, this is what happens when you get beat. Oh, this is what happens when you have a seizure. So I could use that as an in narrative of human consciousness so that when I go, when someone comes to me who's an alcoholic or a drug addict or someone who's been abused or someone who's been raped or someone who's been this, I know the narrative and what it felt like and I know how to navigate them out of that situation. 
Well, I, I, great similarities. So I've, I've had all this, I was old when I was young. <laughs> Most of the diseases of aging sort of were in my 20s and younger. Uh, and that's why I wrote Superhuman. But I, I freely will admit, I would not be able to do the things that I do today had I not gone through the experiences I've gone through, like they were, they were learning experiences for me. I, I don't, I don't look at them as I was a victim of them like you, but in fact, I'm grateful for them because they brought me some things. Could a New Yorker likewise not say I'm grateful that the buildings fell down because it brought a spiritual awareness to my community that wasn't there before? It, it, is that kind of the direction you're going with this? Well, what I'm saying is this, Dave, is that you had all these experiences that happened to you that made you go and say, okay, I'm going to create this company. I'm going to create this superhuman. I'm going to write this book. I'm going to do all these things. That was things that actually showed you what was necessary in the world based on your experiences. But like, for instance, Lord Siddhartha, who became Gautama Buddha, if you look at a lot of the statues and, and pictures of him, you'll see pictures where he's fasting, you'll see pictures where he's gluttonous, you'll see pictures where he's going through different experiences because the narrative of those experiences was not the suffering, it was understanding it as a tool to forward humanity. And so what I'm talking about is that oh, what we do on earth is that we people sit sedentary and they don't do anything until something happens instead of using that as a, a fuel to boost them to say, OK, you know what, I'm, I'm going through this. And that's what I'm talking about is that it's the idea that you're not going to do anything until something drastically happens. Like all of a sudden you find out you have cancer and you're like, OK, now I'm going to start eating healthy. Now I'm going to go actually read Dave's books. Now I'm going to go do all of these different things. Now I'm going to read Spirit Hacking and see what Chalman Derek was talking about. Now I'm going to go and do these things. I'm saying, when are we going to get to a point in our evolution where we don't need to have those things because we're living in a place where we're maintaining self-sustainability by the way in which we live every single day as not something where people have to force themselves to meditate. They have to force themselves to do yoga. They have to put clocks on to remind themselves to do these things because it's not, it's not authentic yet. To make it an authentic functioning, it has to become just as authentic as, as you taking a shower or brushing your teeth. That's what I'm talking about. Got it. I think some people are still working on brushing their teeth. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, on chapter eight in your book, uh, you write about uh, connect and you write about an ancestor altar. And the first time I ever saw this was uh, one of my friends, uh, Himanth, from uh, from business school. I uh, went to his house and he had this this. Uh, ancestor altar in his house and really successful, amazing, just big hearted human. And I was just thinking, this is so foreign. I've never seen anything like this. I'm like that's kind of a cool idea. And then I think back and a lot of Westerners, we have, you know, a wall where there's pictures of family and, and things like that. And some of my earliest uh, shamanic oriented teachers said, Oh, you know, you need to have pictures of your, of your departed grandparents in a place where you can see them. And none of them could really tell me why they just said things work better when you honor your ancestors. What's the deal with that? And I mean, you write about this word hacking, but tell people listening, what's the deal? Okay, so I always tell people, if you don't connect to your ancestors, I'm so concerned about you. And the reason why in shamanism is that in ancient days, being connected to your ancestors, if someone was making a decision or they're making a decision in business or anything of that nature, in the ancient days, they would consult, they would wait for the ancestors to give them a message or a sign or a vision or a dream. Your ancestors had lived this narrative of life on earth, and now they're on the other side. They're in the realm of invisible, which means they have more access, more ability to see everything you're doing and what's coming your way, what things you can dodge. And they also have power, if you are connected to them, to tap into your energy and create impulses in you that are, that are run through your system, through synthesis, through energy that is connected into your, what I call your conductor, your brain, that allow you to see certain things so you can navigate a path to the places where you need to be that's for your highest good or for your benefit or for your best life. So when people are not connected to their ancestors, they're literally pretty much walking around without having this extra protection of this family that has lived it and knows everything that you're going through because they're the ones who created it for you because they passed it down through generation to generation. I have this one guy, for instance, um, you know, who the moment he started bringing an ancestor altar to his house, he said everything changes in his life. He said money got better. He got a new relationship. Everything that he saw was a struggle and it was difficulty. All of it started smoothing out because his ancestors were on the other side doing all of this stuff to assist him in his life. 
It's a really big deal. We've lost contact with our old ways and we have to okay. bring it back. What if your ancestors were, were douchebags or or Nazis or like bad people, or at least that's your narrative for them? Well, that's even still better. Do it? Okay, how does that that's work? even better because when you die, you go through, so for, so I'll tell you from my own experience because you know that I died in the hospital. So when I died, I died with a 10.6 potassium. And when I died, the first thing that happened was I had to look at everything that I did in my life from the time that I was a child to when up to the point of me dying and how I affected every single person. And in order for me to have passed over into the light when, when I went to the other side and got the messages of why we're on earth and what this whole thing's all about, the first thing that happened was I had to be okay and accept everything that I did and go towards the light. And the moment I accept it, the light came and I went into the light. So your ancestors, who were those Nazis, who were those people, who were those things? By the way, I have none of that that I'm aware of. <laughs> just, just so we're clear, I don't think I have Nazi ancestors. Uh, probably yeah. the opposite of that. Just so we're all really clear. Uh, but, but just for some listening, so in other words, all of us have people somewhere going back 200 years who did some bad shit. Like, yeah. That's, so that's they, so when yeah. they crossed over, they got a chance to see how those choices were constructed, yeah. what incidents took place to make them construct those choices, yeah. and then they got to see the choices they could have made and what would have happened because you see it quantumly you see everything so they are helping you in such a greater way because now that not only do they have that ability they have the ability to navigate you in stronger ways than if it was just your ancestor who lived on earth and just pretty much was on a farm their whole life but to an ancestor who had lived a very interesting life they have so much wisdom to pass down to you now that they see the bigger picture I, I love that. And and also going back to what we said earlier, look, any form of aversion or ill will is coming from ego or not from you. So if you have negative feelings about your ancestors, you kind of want to work on that. And that's one of the big things I have people do at 40 Years of Zen. Like if, you're, if your story about your family is full of darkness, forgive it all. Just like let it go. Right? So that you now can resonate with it. You can learn the good and you can just let go of it. And it's it's a really important healing thing to do. So it's it, it's a it's complex and it's all super mushy and it's entirely not rational by Western truth table computer science values. I just had to get comfortable with the fact that a portion of me is highly rational and probably a larger portion of, of at least the the meat operating system that that I live in uh, is not very rational and by being able to do things like an ancestor altar and breathing exercise and stuff that makes absolutely no sense, but that works, that you gotta do both in order to be highly functional. You have to have one foot in both worlds. And I think in Spirit Hacking You, you described that really well. Well, Shaman Dork, I feel like I could talk to you about another oh, two or three hours, uh, but uh, I know that we're at the end of the show. People can buy your book anywhere books are sold. It's called Spirit Hacking. It's a great book. The foreword, I got to say, is really shockingly awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, guys, I, I, did, uh, I, I, I did do this. Uh, and uh, your website is shamanduric.com. Yes. Uh, so th thanks for being on the show. Just thanks for just making some of these crazy shamanic things way more accessible and understandable. I think you're, you're doing a service. Thank you, Dave. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I appreciate you. If you like today's episode, you know what to do. Head on over to your favorite place for buying books and pick up a copy of Spirit Hacking and start hacking your spirit. And while you're at it, after you read the book, leave a review because it's amazing. Shaman Durek and I, as authors, we actually look at our reviews because it tells us how good of a job we did. And it also helps other people find our books if our books are worthy of your attention. I've done my homework. I do my best to only have people on the show who write things and do things that give you more back than the time and energy you spend reading and absorbing it. And Spirit Hacking hits that, that level for you. So check out Spirit Hacking and leave a review for it or any other books, oh, I don't know, like Superhuman, that you also love. Have an awesome day. <laughs> <laughs>